I too am at home again this week because I wanted to talk about urgency. This is where God's moving and this is where I wanted to be because this is where you are. So thank you so much for inviting us into your home. Quick, quick little peek, a little, just a little snapshot of what, not what you see. Here's a little snapshot of what I see and you can see how close my snoring bulldog is to me right now. So check this out. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Um, so that's what I'm seeing. So you, you pray for me as I'm praying for you right now, okay? Okay. Well, hands up in the chat. Hands up. That little hands up emoji. Because last Sunday, eight people committed to become followers of Jesus for the very first time. Eight people committed to be followers of Jesus. And you may be watching us today and you're just checking it out. You've been invited by a friend. I want you to know you're not here by accident, that God loves you so much. And so just open your heart to this message of his gospel. And I pray that God does something in you extraordinary today. I really, really do. But hands up, eight people. Amazing. We celebrate that wholeheartedly. Um, we're in this value, we're looking at the value of urgency, okay? We're looking at what it is to be urgent. And so when we talk about being urgent, here's what we mean. Is that people need Jesus. They need Jesus today. Uh, we do things with a sense of urgency because every day people live and they leave and they die without knowing Jesus. And living lost one more day is one too many. Hey, that's when we're talking about urgency. So again, please don't hear panic. Please don't hear anxious. Please don't hear busyness. That's not what we're speaking into. Those things are thieves in our lives, but urgency is a gift. It reorients our priorities. It puts them in proper perspective. You know, I want us as a church also to be continuing to pray for the province of Nova Scotia that experienced such, such senseless violence and tragedy last weekend in multiple Canadians who lost their lives for no good reason. There's no good reason ever. But as a church, let's be praying for the church in Nova Scotia, for everyone who's Nova Scotian, who knows someone, who lost someone they love, that they can be comforted and encouraged in this impossible time, that they would know just this precious move of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and in their lives. But like you, I was devastated when I saw that. So let's continue to pray for the province of Nova Scotia together. You know, when we experience tragedies like this, you know, you and I live in such a polarized political world where we often have these contrasts between left and right, between right and wrong. And yes, there's left and there's right. And yes, there is right and there's wrong. But we have these little boxes that we put things into that for us, they try to make sense of the world. But when Jesus came, he also used contrast, but he used them differently. For Jesus, he often used lost and found. Uh, we like kind of different boxes, but he used lost and found. And he also used another one called wise and foolish. And I want to speak into both of those today as we look at this value of urgency. You know, so Jesus one day, uh, he told the story, he told a couple stories actually about being wise or being foolish. And one is how in a storm, so if you're in the chat, you can just type storm, just type it out, just type, so just so that I know that you're engaged, you can type the word storm. Um, but he, he spoke about how storms have this way of surfacing what our lives are built upon. And they can be seasons of orientation and reorientation and reorienting our priorities. Again, it, it's not the storm that we're looking at. It's the tool that can be used in our lives to illustrate what our lives are. they built on sand or are they built on something that is solid, that is immovable in this type of season. But another interesting parable that Jesus told that we want to dig into was in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. And because I'm in my house, I want my daughters to read it this morning. So Emma and Allie, take it away. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went off to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. For the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took their flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for the lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will be not enough for us and for you, 
go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. That was awesome. Thanks, Em. Thanks, Allie. Uh, okay, first, first, a little bit of context. And this is not going to be too hard to understand because um, you just heard words like bridegroom and maybe some different words. So a, a Jewish wedding custom, as I understand it, but a Jewish wedding custom was for the groom and his friends to travel to the home of his bride, or to the bride, and where the ceremony would take place. And then after the ceremony, so there couldn't be a degree of time in between there, um, the entire wedding party would return to the groom's house for the celebratory banquet or for the, you know, in our context, the reception, okay? And so Jesus tells a story of a wedding that takes place, and here are these 10 individuals Five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. He calls them the wise, the 10, there's 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish. And they all have lamps. And their role is that when the bridegroom comes, they're to light their lamps so that they can walk with light, that they can see where they're going and they can get from one place to the other with safety. That that's the whole heart. That's the custom. That's the parable that he is leaning into. And so, again, it's, it's not about the guests. It's about when the bridegroom comes, that they're to be ready. Okay, because the whole day is about the bride and it's about the groom. That's the whole day. It's all about it's all about them. So it's their responsibility to be ready to move again, often at night when the bridegroom appeared. So in this parable, here's the question we want to ask today. What do they all have in common? Well, there's a few things that they all have in common. They're all virgins, so they all have similar life experience. They all have lamps, external things. All right. And they all know at some point what their job is, that the bridegroom is coming. So they have all of those things in common. And they all experience also something else, which is that there's a delay. So between when they maybe thought the bridegroom is coming to when the bridegroom actually shows up, they all experience the same delay. And here's what's big. The scripture or the parable that Jesus tells in the delay, in the delay, they all become drowsy and they all fall asleep. Now, here's what I think is big for us to dig into. It's our first kind of takeaway from the parable is in the delay. Everybody in the chat type the word delay. Okay. So in the delay, sometimes that can be between when prayer is asked and when it's answered. Sometimes in our lives, it can be in a grand sense, like they're looking at here between when Jesus first came and when he returns. That's a delay, all right? Um, so there's can be all these different, it can be really small or can actually be larger. So in the delay, here's what's huge, is in this place, it's difficult to distinguish wise from foolish. So in the world in which you and I live today, it's sometimes we all have the same life experiences. We all have, you know, we're all human. We all have relationships. We all have stuff. We all have wounds. We all have things that are good. We all have things that are bad. And so again, at a cursory look at the world in which we live, sometimes when you just look at it the way we often look at the world is it's hard to distinguish wise from foolish because again all of our shared experiences we're all human we have the same life similar life experiences maybe a bit different but we all have experiences in life uh, we all have relationships we all have stuff we all have wounds we all have good things we all have bad things and all of that is similar anywhere you go different cultures every nation tribe kindred tug it's really all the same things okay different stuff but really similar experiences and so again, um, it's, it's huge to look at through the value of urgency that in the delay, oftentimes we can, we, it can be hard to distinguish wise from foolish. It's, it's hard to see it. But I think there's also a beautiful thing that we look at. It says that they all become drowsy and they all sleep. And I think this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Remember, when God, the original in Genesis chapter one, God creates the world and, and as the creator, he builds into the whole idea of creation, the whole idea of these seven days, that there's one day that we're to Sabbath. There's one day that we're to rest. And so I think it's amazing, even in this parable, that you and I can see that every single one of us 
get drowsy. Every single one of us gets sleepy. Every single one of us in life get distracted. None of us live fierce and focused every second of the day. No, we have these things of Sabbath where we can rest, trusting that God's working when we don't have to work, that we don't have to work ourselves to the bone, that we're not human doings, that we are human beings who do, that rest is okay. So when I read the parable, one of these beautiful kind of like offshoots within it is the wise and foolish is not differentiated by who falls asleep. They all fall asleep. They all get drowsy. They all fall asleep. And for Jesus, this doesn't seem to be a really big deal. I think that's a big, a a, a little point in the parable that has large implications. Because, you know, there are some of you have been taught, man, that your salvation depends on you, that you got to be, watch for Jesus is coming, watch for Jesus is coming. And it's as though everything rests on you. I can never take a break. I can never take a second off. You know, and you just live with this tension. But there is a place of trusting. There is a place of surrender. There is a place of rest in God where you can still be watching, but also trusting and being still and knowing that he is God, right? There is this place that you and I can engage that being wise or foolish doesn't mean that we have to live our lives in fifth gear, never taking a break. How many of you know we're not the savior of the world? We're not the healer of the world. We're not the provider of the world. Jesus is those things. And sometimes when we're resting, he's still working. He's still moving. He's still doing what needs to be done. Yes, he uses our lives, but it doesn't always just have to be you. It's an entire body. So again, I think there's a little, there's a little subtext in here that I just wanted to lean into in a moment. I also think it's really interesting in the parable that the problem is present, but in the delay, the issue is present. The problem is present. It's just not experienced. And I think that's powerful because the five wise virgins have oil in their lamp and the five foolish ones do not have oil in their lamp. And when the bridegroom shows up, it is evident who is wise or who is foolish, but the problem is persisted a lot longer than just when the bridegroom shows up. I think that's important for us to look at. And so again, no oil was no problem until it was. I'm going to say it again. No oil was no problem until it was. Until the bridegroom, as the story Jesus told, until the bridegroom shows up. And in this story, it's at midnight. It's at an unexpected time. But when the bridegroom shows up, here's what we see. They all do the same external thing. It says, they all the virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. They got ready to light them, to light the way so the bridegroom would have light to begin to walk and they would be walking in safety. They all rose, took their external things and tried to do the same thing. But here's what's amazing. They all took their external lamps and they all did the same external thing But the problem was, as Jesus often said, is the work of God is not an external thing. It's an internal thing. It is something that God does on the inside of us that flows then to the outside of us. It's not an outside in thing. It's an inside out thing. Think of all the things that Jesus talked, even to the religious leaders of his day. He said the cup looks great on the outside, but the inside is where the problem is. It's not the things from the outside that we take in that make us unclean. It's the things on the inside. And so Jesus continues to drive this home. No oil really meant no source to light the flame or to carry the light. It wasn't a problem until it was. And everything about this parable points to light. What did Jesus say that you and I were called to be in the world that he loves, that we love, and that we live in? He said we're called to be salt and we're called to be, yeah, we're called to be light. It's what we're called to be. But how that 
or how that stays lit or is lit, I should say, in our lives really speaks to the source of our lives, not to the external things. So the bridegroom shows up, five have oil, five do not. And now we're beginning to see in that moment wise and foolish. Once again, not looking at external things, not looking just at outside things. Jesus is now looking at an inside thing. You know, oil in the scripture is always meant to represent consecration. Oil is always about being set apart by a work of the Holy Spirit that happens on the inside of our hearts. It is representing that our hearts are not transformed by good works or being good people. Those are good things, but they're not which transform our hearts. That salvation, again, is is not trying to be a good person, living your whole life this way, and at the end, hoping you've just done enough, that you've been good enough, that you've loved enough people or served enough people who did a lot of good things. No, see, the gospel, again, is not good and bad. The gospel, according to Jesus, is dead and alive, that all of us are dead in our sins. All of us, that the source of our heart, the sin needs to be dealt with, that we needed a Savior, and our Savior is Jesus, and that He brings us not from good to bad, but from dead to alive, and then hopefully as alive, we do amazing good things, we do wonderfully good things, but we don't do them for salvation, we do them from a place of gratitude, from a place of love, from a place of joy, which again, isn't rooted in external things like experiences, and I'm having a good day, or I'm not having a good day or or when I'm having a good day, then I'm good to other people. But when I'm having a bad day, then I don't. Or 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 when I have more or when I have enough, then I'm generous. No, 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 no. We have this internal source that Jesus is our savior. He's our healer. He's our friend. He's our king. He's a, he is the source of life on the inside of our hearts and our lives. And so watch what it says. Watch what this parable says. It says, the foolish said to the wise, what do they say? Give us some of your oil. Okay. Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. So here's a question that Jesus is inviting every one of us who are listening to it on that day, but on this day to think or to ask. Here's the question. Why can't they just give or share their oil? Why can't they do it? I mean, in other stories, Jesus said, if someone asks for your shirt, give them your coat too. In other stories, Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Let them strike you on that cheek. I'll Canadianify this one for you. But in other stories, Jesus said, if someone asks you to walk a kilometer, there's the Canadianified message. Someone asks you to walk a kilometer, walk too. So in this instance, wait a minute, time out. Aren't Christians, aren't we supposed to be generous? Aren't we called to give, even give sacrificially? Why can't, why in this story then can they not just share their oil? And here's the heart of what Jesus is driving at, is we can share Jesus with everyone, but we can't save anyone. It is a gift from God given to individuals, to people. It is not something that you or I can give. We can share the good news. We can share the gospel. We can do all of those things, but we cannot save anyone. The work of salvation The work of Jesus giving you this oil of salvation, this consecration, this being set apart where your life's not only your own, that you live now for the glory of God and the heart of God. Again, the work of salvation, of grace, is our story to share, yes, but it is God's grace to give and it is others to accept. I want to say that again, that the work of salvation is our story to share with this sense of urgency, but it is God's grace to give, and it is others to accept, or even sometimes, sadly, to reject. You know, for Jesus, lost can become found in any moment, even in this moment. And so the good news, the good news is today. If you're in the chat, just type the word today. The good news is today 
is the day of salvation. Today, there is fresh oil from God available to you if we use the language of this parable. What Jesus is saying is stark that it may be in the delay which we're living in between when Jesus first came and so while he's coming back in the delay, it's hard to see. It's hard to see wise from foolish, but he is saying there's going to be a day where that is going to be realized that when you and I breathe our last breath or Jesus returns or tarries in our lifetime or in the generations ahead, who knows? Nobody knows, but it's going to be a day. There will be a day where Jesus says he'll be able to see wise from foolish. But in the delay, I need you to know he's as close as the mention of his name. And so today, the scripture says, if you would believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. In other words, he's the one that you're going to give up these ways of trying to be good enough, of trying self-salvation. Again, that is akin to a virgin in the story having no oil at all all and trying to conjure up that which they don't have. It's dead works. It doesn't work. But if we can understand that having oil is what Jesus gives us, it is this source that only he gives. It is the salvation, this grace, which he makes available to me and he makes available to you. The parable goes on to say, afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. In another verse, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, and here's the words, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I don't know you doesn't mean God doesn't know who you are. What it means oftentimes is that you are living. Not, I don't know about God but I don't have a personal relationship with God through the work of Jesus. You know, I know about Prime Minister Trudeau, but I do not know Prime Minister Trudeau. And so I, he has friends who could show up to his residence and they'd be welcome into his home because he knows them. Well, if I showed up at his residence, I'm telling you, I'm not going to be welcome into his home because I know about him but I don't know him. He, he doesn't know who I am and I don't know who he is relationally. So in that terse type of example, wise and foolish from God's perspective is not looking at life with all the external things. And lost and found is separated by a single choice and a single decision. It's not based on what Jesus has done. He has already lived and died and rose again and shed his blood so that you and I can be forgiven, that we can break off the shackles of being lost and we can become found. And Jesus says that moving from lost to found also means that you and I move from being wise to being, um, from being foolish to becoming wise. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, But God's firm foundation, his solid anchoring rock, stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord, let them depart from sin or depart from iniquity, from behavior that's crooked. So the question today is, are you wise or are you foolish? For Jesus, this isn't money. This isn't success. This isn't political party. This isn't marital status or whatever else you want to place there. For, the, for Jesus, this is defined once again by looking at eternity and then living backward. Second Corinthians is the final scripture I want to say today. 6 verse 2 says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so you may be here today 
and you're intellectually wise, but you're spiritually out of oil. You may be emotionally wise or even materialistically wise, but you're out of oil. Well, I want you to know that we have a sense of urgency, that you can today, in this day, move from lost to found, from foolish to wise, not based on what you have done, but based upon what Jesus has done that you and I can receive. So it would be my honor to lead you in prayer. And if you would open your heart and let us know that's me, then we'd love to follow up. So together, let's pray and let's say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me just the way I am yet loving me enough not to leave me the way I am. And so I confess, I am a sinner in need of salvation. So save me. In Jesus' name I pray.